You know, uh, some of us try to talk about boycott uh, uh, in the days of the South African apartheid system. And it was not easy to talk about that in the churches. But some came around. And uh, I've met South African leading clergy who went to Palestine and said, this is even worse. And not too long ago, Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu used three adjectives in a couple of sentences about the occupation. Vicious, wicked, and brutal. And I think this needs to be said when the issues of what happens to people in the occupation is so much missing from our media. It's an absolute delight to introduce uh, to you, if you have not met her, Linda Khatib. She has come out here from Chicago. Uh, her husband is tagging along and sitting next to her, <laughs> which was a great event in both of their lives and for the lives of those of us who know them both now. Linda, for 35 years, worked in the Chicago school, a Public School District as a reading specialist, as a specialist with gifted children, an instructional coach in high-risk schools, Mostly, I understand, in the south side of Chicago, not the easiest place to work in or grow up in. She also was very involved with several state and local curriculum projects and publications and teacher seminars. She's American-born of Palestinian parents. And just in these past several years especially, Although she's been there before, she's been going quite regularly to the occupied Palestinian territories. The town that she's from, right outside of Ramallah, is where she has family property, and I meant to bring up a copy, but you can find them over there, of The Link. The Link is talking about a class action suit against the uh, Israeli government, I believe it is, in which Linda is mentioned in that article. So I hope you get a copy of the link and see what they're doing about that. She has been, uh, as I say, quite a frequent, fl frequent flyer. Visit <laughs> Don't get pulled off the, off the plane. Uh, <laughs> but uh, she and Don have been leading uh, uh, witness trips to that region most recently this last month, early last month, of which some of us here were privileged to be a part. Linda Khatib, good to have you with us. Once again, I want to thank you, Daryl, the other organizers, the wonderful speakers, and all of you participants for your tireless efforts to advocate for peace and justice in Palestine. Um, as Daryl mentioned, um, my parents are Palestinian. My dad comes from Betunia, my mom from Jerusalem. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about a trip that Daryl, Don, and I uh, were on in Palestine just last month. Um, and I'm going to share the, some of the highlights of that trip in the context of discussing what are the signs of hope and what can we do. First, before I share that, I want to um, give you a little bit of two personal stories. The first has to do with um, a communication that I received in February of 2014 on Facebook. I received a message from someone who said he was my cousin. I didn't know who this person was. It turned out he was the grandson of my uncle. And he told me that he was living in the house that my dad built in Petunia before he met my mom and married her. So he said, you have to come to Palestine because your dad has six pieces of land in Area C. Now, the house my dad built is in Area A, which is about 18% of the West Bank. Area C is about 82% of the West Bank. A is under... Palestinian uh, civil and military control. Area C is total Israeli civil and military control. 
So I went to Palestine. It turned out I was co-leading a witness trip, so I just made sure that I afterwards stopped off and met them. Uh, I, I met the whole family, uh, he and his wife, and eight of his 11 children. That is his contribution to resistance. <laughs> yeah. And the wives. Yeah. And so, um, in fact, I found out that um, my dad did own land in Palestine, some of it very large and very valuable. So I, both my parents are deceased, so I went about the process of hiring a lawyer to get the deeds transferred over into my name. And so then um, one year later, when I went with my attorney to Beit Eel to find out the status, the location, the exact location of the properties, to view the properties, I was told by the Israeli official that two of those properties had been sold and if we wanted any more information, we were going to have to speak with an Israeli military commander. Um, I thought that was odd since I had the physical deeds in my hand. And so um, my attorney was a little bit frightened to continue. He wasn't very familiar with the Israeli court system. And um, I'm going to come back to this story a little bit later, but in the meantime, I hired an attorney who is very knowledgeable about uh, Israeli court system. He is Palestinian, a resident of Jerusalem, and I just got a call from him yesterday. We are going to prove forgery on the case of those two lands that were supposedly sold. I have a copy of my dad's signature, and we'll find out which settler group supposedly sold the property to an Israeli company. We'll get those details, he told me, by the end of next week. So where is the hope in this story? Palestine is in the blood of every Palestinian. They are not going to give up, uh, contrary to the belief of Israel. That's why they are more cruel, more treacherous, more um, determined than ever to silence and humiliate uh, and subjugate Palestinians. Um, in fact, more and more Palestinian friends of mine who are afraid to pursue their family's land are now um, really coming forward to find out what they can do to um, seek legal means to connect with their property and their heritage. So story two. Um, in December of 2015, uh, I found out that um, my nephew, uh, Fahim, who was 17 years old at the time, uh, went on an errand for his mom to get a loaf of bread for dinner. The bakery was a half block from his home. In Betunia. In Betunia. On his way back, he saw Israeli soldiers running after Palestinian kids. Maybe they had thrown stones. Now, again, what's odd is Area A is total Palestinian control, which shows that Israel can go wherever they want to go. It doesn't matter what the structure is. They can be wherever they want to be. So he got frightened. Uh, and mind you, his parents have encouraged him, the whole family, do not get involved, don't ever throw stones, come right home. He's a good kid, you know, doesn't cause any problems. He got frightened, he hid. Uh, a soldier found him and beat him very severely on his leg. He said, please don't hit me there, I just had su surgery and the soldier hit him again even harder. His mom heard him. She came out of the house. By this time, they had him in a Jeep that had blackened windows. So she was standing in front of the Jeep where her son was and didn't know it. And she said, I heard my son's name. Where is he? The soldier pointed a rifle in her face and said, if you don't get back into your house, I will shoot you. So then began the arduous uh, task of trying to find out where he was. They live about a five minute drive from Ofer prison. So that evening they drove out there and you know tried to contact uh, somebody to find out if their son had been taken there. The guard speaking from a microphone in the tower 
it took about five to ten minutes for them to even respond, said, your son is not here. All the while, he was there. That first night, he was forced to take off all of his clothes except his underwear and stand outside in the cold. In December, it gets pretty cold there for hours. And his parents didn't know his whereabouts until a, a little over a week later. They were not allowed to speak with him or see him. So um, the first trial was about a month and a half later. They saw him from a distance, couldn't really speak to him. He looked very thin. And then came a series of continuances, I think about five of them, because all the while they were trying to get evidence that he was guilty of throwing stones. But because he had never done it, they were not able to find the evidence. He sat in jail for seven months before he was released. When he was exiting prison, his, um, he was elated. He had a big smile on his face. He was coming out with other young men. And uh, one of the soldiers said, why are you smiling? And he said, I'm happy. I'm going home. And the soldier said, I could turn around and put you right back in jail. And he said, no, you can't. I didn't do anything. And he kept smiling. The soldier hit him so badly on his leg that he was limping for two weeks afterwards. He told his mom, oh, I just took off my shoes and gave them to somebody who needed a new pair of shoes. But he didn't want to worry his mom. The cruelty is unfathomable. The way they try to break spirit is unfathomable. Where's the hope in this story? I, I said to him when I saw him in March, did this experience change you in any way? He said, no, not at all. It made me more aware of the real world, but I am committed to um, working for justice. I am committed to getting my education. So where are we today? 50 years of occupation. The story looks pretty bleak. But every time I feel despair and this futile hopelessness, I travel to Palestine and I'm recharged. The resilience of the people is remarkable. So what I'm going to do is tell you about some of the people with whom we met who did give us hope. First of all, there was Bassam, Naraman, and Ahad Tamimi. They live in a resistance village of Nabi Saleh, and that is a village that has had weekly nonviolent protest demonstrations since December 9th of 2009. This village has 80% of its homes slated for demolition. And the thing about demolition is you never know when it's going to happen, and you have to pay for the demolition. And if you can't afford to pay, you can demolish your own home. Think about the, the sheer um, hopelessness of that situation. And they charge you. Yeah. They charge you still. Nearly every family in that village has, has spent time in jail. They've been tortured. When you are arrested, you have to pay a fine. It could be a thousand, a thousand shekels or more. They have been assaulted with skunk water, uh, sponge bullets, rubber bullets. You know, they sound so um, harmless, sponge and rubber, but they're deadly. They can kill you. Um, skunk water. Um, they now have tanks that can dispense 100 canisters of tear gas. And I was talking with Jeff about the term uh, tear gas. He says it really, you know, belittles the damage that this does. It is so lethal, it takes your breath away. You can't breathe. One family had their young son killed with a tear gas canister that hit his head. And they uh, went to court, and the family was fined 60,000 shekels just for the sheer audacity of going to court to try to get justice for their son's murder. 
So since they, uh, oh, another thing is now, because of the predictability of the weekly um, demonstrations, Israeli settlers have been showing up before the Israeli occupation forces, as many as 30 carloads of violent settlers who have no restraint uh, when it comes to shooting uh, the protesters right on, on site. So because they have lost so many of the young people that way, they have a new strategy. Now they're doing spontaneous demonstrations, not weekly demonstrations, to try to break up the predictability. So what are the signs of hope? Um, Naraman was telling us they're, they're using video cameras to document the violence of the Israeli settlers and the uh, soldiers. And she was telling us about an incident where she uh, saw a young man in the distance whose face was bloodied. It turns out that he had been shot in the face. As she approached, she saw that that was her brother. So the dilemma she had to face was, do I continue to videotape this, or do I embrace my brother as he lay dying? Nobody should have to face a choice like this. When some of us who were so visibly affected began to weep, um, she said, with all due respect, we don't need your tears. We need you to go home to tell our story. And more and more, as Jim said, with witness trips, going to see for yourself, what you see you can never unsee, Israel is becoming uh, a social pariah. They're becoming more and more isolated by the uh, international community. We also met with Sam Bahur, who is a businessman from Youngston, Ohio. He lives now in Elbira. He talks about the invisible occupation the deluge of paper and permits and delays that keep Palestinians in a state of perpetual limbo, waiting, eating up their time and their money. But where is the hope in his story? He believes in the power of international law. He says that more and more churches are divesting from Israel. The EU has required that Israel label all products that are made in settlements, so that is a sign of hope. Isa Ambro lives in uh, Hebron, and he is the director of Youth Against Settlements. And um, he's been jailed many times, but what they do in Hebron is they video act all of, they video record all of the acts of violence, and they immediately put them on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, when a settler attacked him and broke his camera, there was video documentation, and not just one video, video from all different perspectives. So now the hope is uh, journalists from all over the world are coming to him to find out what really happened and get the real story. Mazen Kumsiya, professor, author, activist, jailed many, many times. He is the founder and the director of the Palestine Museum of Natural History and the Institute of uh, Palestinian uh, Biodiversity. And his uh, work in this regard, um, sharing information about the flora and fauna of indigenous Palestinian population is gaining attention worldwide. He tells us um, that Israel's monolithic uh, structure is doomed to fail. And he says that history bears this out. Of 193 countries in the world, one 180 of them have been previously colonized. And how did the others resolve their problems? Well, one way is that the natives can win. This is very rare, but it happened in Algeria. Another way is through genocide. That happened when the weight of natives were wiped out in New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. But what about the other 160 countries they eventually integrated. So he says that history tells, that, tells us that monolithic structures are not going to survive. Eventually, the Holy Land will become an integrated state with freedom and justice for all. We went to the Negev Desert and met Aziz El-Turi uh, in the village of El-Arakib. 
He has the original deed to his family's property that dates back to Ottoman times. Israel originally told them that they could remain where they are as an unrecognized village, meaning that they wouldn't receive any services. Uh, they've always been very sufficient. They didn't need any outside help, their livestock, their cattle. They had a very healthy, thriving community. Then in 2010, Israel destroyed their olive trees. They killed their uh, livestock. They sprayed their crops with chemical. The chemical killed some of their people. His structure of a home has been demolished 109 times. Imagine, he's rebuilt 109 times. Three days after we met with him, it was demolished for the 110th time. What are the signs of hope there? There's an organization called the Negev Coexistence Forum for Civil Equality. It's an NGO that focuses on problems in the Negev, and they provide a framework for Jewish and Arab collaboration in the struggle for equality, tolerance, and coexistence. They sponsor tours for foreign diplomats and members of the Knesset to get an in-depth, honest look at what's happening. And finally, Abdel Fattah Abosror. There were so many people we met with. These are just highlights of some of them. He's the director of the Al Rawad uh, Center in the Ida refugee camp. He has developed what he calls the beautiful resistance, cultural empowerment. Youth are shown how to express themselves through the arts, through dance, photography, music, art, drama. His hope for the future is that education and expression is a weapon against oppression and provides us the way forward. So what can you do? Well, lots of people have commented on some of the things we can do. We have within FASNA a Witness Trip Advisory Council. And if you are interested in a trip to uh, Palestine, you can go to the FASNA website um, and find out about the trips that are being offered. If you know of somebody in a church group or other organization who is sponsoring a trip and would like to um, sponsor a trip that isn't uh, the Holy Land and the Dead Stones, the museums, the ancient religious sites, and the empty churches, but would like to feature the Living Stones, interaction with the Palestinian population, and the narrative that we never hear, FASNA Witness Trip Advisory Council has a pa panel of eight experienced travelers can, that can help you construct a trip that provides some of the experiences that we were able to share. Um, you can learn about the work of Martin McMahon, McMahon the DC attorney who has these lawsuits that Daryl referenced in the link. He has four lawsuits. I'm on four of them. The first one is for Palestinians and Palestinian Americans only. And the other three, anybody can join. For $150, you can be part of these lawsuits. This attorney is doing this work pro bono. It is unbelievable. And so he needs as many people as possible, and your donations will help him continue the work. I'm going to just share very briefly what the... Okay, time's up. So uh, if you want to hear more about these lawsuits, two minutes, uh, okay. two minutes more, okay. The first is a $34.5 billion lawsuit against the Sheldon Adelsons, Moskowitzes, John Hagee, and uh, these are tax-exempt entities that are provided fu massive funding to the settlement operation in the occupied Palestinian territory, also G4S. Um, the second suit is suing the State Department, Treasury Department, and the Defense Department of the U.S. to shut off their funding to Israel because they've violated arms shipments, civil rights agreements. Uh, there are U.S. Treasury and 150 U.S. nonprofit organizations that send about a billion dollars a year in tax-exempt donations to fund the forcible expulsion of all non-Jews and expand illegal settlements. Uh, and then another one is based on this JASTA, the Justice Against Sponsors of Israeli Terrorism Act, where 9-11 victims can sue uh, Saudi Arabia for the losses they endured. Well, this attorney says, well, now it's time on this act for Palestinians to be able to sue uh, uh, Israel for all of their losses. 
So this is just a little bit of what's going on. Thank you.